Dundas. Sir, my views on abolition are well known. I differ from my honorable friend only in the mode of effecting it. I contend that by regulation, we will procure what abolition. Regulation. Regulation. regulation to increase the breed of Negroes in the West Indies. Regulation to increase the proportion of females. Regulation for the education of children. Uh, well, the honorable gentleman yield. I will conclude, sir. I cannot support this motion, but if a motion were to be brought forward along the lines I have suggested, I would most cordially support it. My plea is a plea for moderation. Sir! Sir! Sir, what has been said is so mischievous, I must protest. Moderation. How can you carry on a slave trade in moderation? How can you pillage and destroy a country in moderation? What is there in what the honorable gentleman has said to show that he would ever vote for abolition? We cannot modify injustice. The question is, to what period of time we shall prolong it. Some think we should be unjust for 10 years. <laughs> Others think it is quite enough to be unjust for five years. <laughs> Others uh, that this century should continue in its disgrace and that justice should commence its operation at the opening of another. <laughs> argument uh, that has not been used at all and is the foundation for this whole business. I mean the question of color. Uh, suppose a ship was to sail from Bristol to France where the utmost fury of civil war is reported to prevail and the Democrats were to sell the aristocrats or uh, vice versa. <laughs> to be carried to Jamaica and sold as slaves. Such a transaction would strike horror into every man. And why? Because they are of our color. <laughs> My honorable friends, I believe this traffic to be impolitic. I know it to be inhuman. I am certain it is unjust. It is so inhuman that if the plantations cannot be cultivated without it, they ought not to be cultivated at all. This table is never loaded with petitions, but where the people of England feel an actual grievance. Quite so, quite so. And this house ought to feel itself bound to give a remedy. First and last, ought the slave trade to be abolished? Because it is a noxious plant under whose shade nothing that is useful or profitable to Africa can ever flourish or take root. We cannot wait for other nations to act with us. Ours is the largest share of the trade, ours the deepest guilt. Let no man say that Africa labors under a natural incapacity for civilization, that Providence has doomed her to be a nursery of slaves. Human sacrifice, my honorable friends, was once practiced in these islands, and Britons have been sold for slaves to Rome. 
Might not some Roman senator have pointed to the British barbarians and said, there is a people who will never rise to civilization. There is a people never destined to be free. We are not to be compared, sir. We, we were once as obscure among the nations of the earth. If we listen to the voice of reason and duty and pursue this day the line of conduct they prescribe, some of us may live to see the reverse of that picture from which we now turn our eyes with shame and regret. We may behold the beams of science and philosophy breaking in upon their land, which at some happy period in still later times may blaze with full luster, may illuminate and invigorate the most distant extremities of that immense continent. And I shall oppose to the utmost every proposition which may tend to prevent or even to postpone for one hour the total abolition of the slave trade. should I have in my hand, the avowed end of which is the total abolition of the slave trade. I wish exceedingly at the outset to guard both myself and the house from entering into this subject with any sort of passion. I ask only for your impartial reason. I mean to accuse no one, but to take the shame upon myself in common with the whole parliament of Great Britain for having suffered this horrid trade to be carried on under our authority. We are all guilty. We ought all to plead guilty and not to excuse ourselves by throwing the blame onto others. I will not accuse the Liverpool merchants. I will allow them, nay, I believe them to be men of humanity. But I verily believe that if the wretchedness of any one of the many hundred Negroes in each ship could be brought before their view, there is not one among them whose heart would bear it. And yet, that same situation was described to the Privy Council by a well-known Liverpool captain <laughs> in terms which I am sure must convince the whole house that self-interest can draw a film over the eyes, so thick that blindness itself could do no more. In order not to trust to mere description, I will call the House's attention to one species of evidence that is absolutely infallible. Death, at least, provides a sure ground of proof. It will be found from evidence given at the Privy Council that not less than twelve and a half percent perish during the passage. <laughs> not less than four and a half percent die on shore before the time of their sale. <laughs> and one third more die in the seasoning. <laughs> Upon the whole, there is a mortality of about 50 percent. <laughs> And this, this is among Negroes who are not bought unless, as the phrase is, with cattle. They are sound in wind and limb. <laughs> what need is there of further testimony? The number of deaths speaks for itself and makes all inquiry superfluous. Sir. The nature of this trade is now laid open to us. We can no longer plead ignorance. We cannot evade it. 
We may spurn it. We may kick it out of the way. But we cannot turn aside so as to avoid seeing it. For it is brought now so directly before our eyes that this house must decide. And it must justify to all the world and to its own conscience the grounds for its decision. Yeah.